Our team is privileged to have been given the opportunity to embark on a journey filled with deep, personal, emotional, and professional challenges. Alan Schwartz and Les Klein came together with a common purpose and a shared belief, based in part on their personal histories, in the importance of a monument dedicated to the remembrance of the Holocaust as part of Canada's cultural and historical landscape. We sought out Jeffrey Kraft, a Canadian partner in the international design firm SWA Group, to design the monument. We added two internationally recognized young artists, Yael Bartana and Susan Phillips. Hen Tamir, our curator, helped to ensure that each artist could express herself individually, while their work and the monument maintained a cohesive point of view. Our Holocaust scholars, Deborah Dwork and Jeff Korber, were vital in helping to articulate our message. We invite you to join us on this journey and to experience for yourselves the journey visitors will take when they visit the monument. From the moment our team was assembled, our initial journey was one of thought and reflection. It culminated in a shared vision for what this monument must achieve, and this morning we want to share that vision with you. From the outset, we concluded that the monument must bring into focus, for a whole new generation, the meaning of the millions of lives lost in the Holocaust, and to do so, we set out to achieve four central goals. First, to create a meaningful connection to the Holocaust for all visitors, including those who have no direct link to it or its victims, opening their hearts and minds to an understanding of the Holocaust for both its historic specificity and as a universal metaphor of evil. Next, we wanted to impress upon visitors the evil of this atrocity so that they examine and confront the dangers of silence and the consequences of indifference, helping to ensure that its horrors will never be forgotten. And we wanted to encourage visitors to remember with sensitivity and solemnity the millions who died and suffered, along with the resilience of the survivors, perpetuating and honoring their memory among future generations, and finally, we wanted to evoke the lives of those who perished, celebrating the vitality of the human spirit, even in the face of hopelessness and annihilation. And because we wanted to open the hearts and minds of all visitors, the new immigrant to Nova Scotia, the family from rural Alberta, to the school group from Montreal, we were determined to create a unique monument that would engage visitors by creating an overall multi-sensory experience that fuses the best in moving image, sound, and landscape into a solemn, all-embracing experience with the widest possible appeal. As an introduction to our monument concept, we will begin with an overview of its form and massing and the thematic approach to its design. We will first look at a series of two-dimensional views, and then we will take you on a three-dimensional journey through the monument itself. Located immediately adjacent to the Canadian War Museum and the Firefighters Monument, the triangular-shaped site is set directly on the processional to and from Parliament Hill. Starting with the ground plane, a flat, triangular piece of land, we begin with a blank canvas of sorts. Two objects rise from the earth in the form of limestone berms that will be covered in a birch forest, a direct metaphor for the native landscapes of Canada and Europe. Overlaying the berms is a black granite monolith we call the Transcendent Structure. Its exterior is symbolic of the oppressive nature of war and the Holocaust, but from beneath it is a symbol of rebirth and resilience. The transition zone borders the northern portion of the site and it is envisioned as a native Canadian landscape, designed as a component part of the monument site, but possibly temporary in nature. The core of the monument is the location of the primary contemplative space. Although there are many other opportunities for quiet contemplation, this area offers the visitor a quiet refuge. A large event space is provided in the monument's forecourt, a birch forest berm runs along the curve of Wellington Street, evoking a park-like quality. The transcendent structure sits as a focal object resting on the forested berm. 
Limestone seat walls encircle the site, allowing seating for up to 250 people. Small group gathering space is provided in the interpretive zone at the eastern egress or entry. The donor recognition area is located within a portal carved into the transcendent structure. The dedication message etched into the granite face of the transcendent structure is visible from the War Museum. To help illustrate our concept, we have created a three-dimensional fly-through. From this perspective, you can see the primary elements and massing of the structures. This includes the large forecourt or plaza at the monument's entry, the transcendent structure and the landscape quality of the forested berm. We envision the core of the monument as a place of quiet contemplation and artistic expression. But in its entirety, the monument is a multi-sensory experience that involves sight, hearing, smell, and touch. Most importantly, we believe that the monument is not a static object or singular abstract art piece, but a complete experience that marries art, technology, and landscape in a highly emotional and intellectual manner. We see this as a new form of monument. Our first view is from the front entrance of the Canadian War Museum. We have been highly considerate of the views to and from the monument and the significance of its form in relationship to the site, the museum, and other adjacent monuments. Of note from this view is the orientation of the monument, with its transcendent structure facing the museum and its forecourt entry addressing the museum and Le Breton Park. It is both welcoming and a highly visible reminder of the horrors of the Holocaust. Our second view is from the corner of the Museum and Booth Street. Visible here is the forecourt or plaza entry to the monument, capable of accommodating 1,000 people standing with overflow into the transition zone if necessary, or 500 people seated beneath temporary structures. The dedication will be inscribed directly to the transcendent structure, visible from the War Museum, but not the primary entry to the monument core. The native limestone of the berms supports the birch forest and adds form and structure. Our next view is from the corner of Booth and Wellington Streets. The granite transcendent structure lays heavy on the landscape with its roughened and black outer skin, yet it transitions to a textured white limestone on its inner facade, rising in celebration of the resiliency of the survivors of the Holocaust and as an inspiration to future generations. The monument is meant to be accessible day and night, and the quality of the ambient lighting will add drama and contribute to the complete sensory experience. The paving, too, is meant to be sensory, but in a subtle, subconscious way, smooth at the periphery, it gradually transitions to a traditional European cobble as the visitor approaches the core of the monument and contemplative area. The monument is meant to be a tactile experience, we invite the visitor to physically engage with the structure and the art contained within. As the limestone berm rises from the earth in a sculpted form, it wraps the monument, providing a seat wall for up to 100 people along Wellington Street. We see the birch forest and underplanting of native grasses and perennials as a symbol of the common landscapes of Canada and Eastern Europe. And it is important to note that the Germans named the death camp Birkenau after the Polish village of Brzezinka, whose name stems from birch trees. The birch forest is a symbol of death and horror, a place of hiding and refuge, and of rebirth and regeneration. And it is a common landscape language that transcends time and geography. Our next view is a winter scene looking west down Wellington Street. The sweep of the curve of the berm directs the view to the west towards the transcendent structure and the War Museum visible through the transition zone. The monument is meant to be celebrated during all seasons. In winter, the contrast of the black granite and the white limestone will be complemented by the black and white birch bark. 
The materials of the monument have been selected not only for their metaphorical attributes, but for their durability and as native Canadian materials, specifically the granite and limestone, and the selection of native Canadian trees, shrubs, ground covers, grasses, and perennials. As an Order One gateway node, we see our monument as a major contributor to the urban infrastructure of Ottawa. It is a park, a plaza, and a solemn destination that integrates seamlessly into its neighborhood. At the portal through the transcendent structure, we have located the donor recognition inscription. Etched directly to the granite surface, it has been symbolically located in the entryway and will commemorate the individuals and organizations that have made the monument possible. Moving along the north face of the transcendent structure, the visitor walks west towards the monument's forecourt, past the dedication message, and is offered a glimpse of the contemplative space. Like a processional, we move inwards to the primary art exhibit area. Within the monument core, the space is both quiet and somber. The natural light will be dimmed and the air will be cooler, and the earthy smell of the planted berm will be noticeable. At the center, we have placed a highly polished granite seating structure, which may house the projection equipment for the art of Yael Bartana, which is visible above on the upsweep of the white limestone of the transcendent structure. Yael will create an original multi-channel video that will be motion activated. These silent images will be projected on the interior wall of the transcendent structure, enveloping the visitor in a highly emotive, entrancing experience. Her innovative work will depict a montage of Holocaust-related objects and images in a never-ending slow-motion freefall, which symbolizes both a loss of control and the momentous, irretrievable loss caused by the Holocaust. The slow, beautifully undulating dance of these objects, depicted in high visual definition, floating down the interior wall, will be arresting and induce solemn contemplation. You will now see an early maquette of the work and hear the voice of Yael describing in her own words the vision for what will be her complete work. I would like to create a montage of images of objects in a never-ending free form, suggesting representation of our collective memory of the Holocaust. Elements that are representing a loss, a void, trauma, that we need to accept as part of our life. The footage will include personal objects connected to life before the war, during the war, and after the war. It will also include more abstract things like dust, ashes, broken glass, and fire. Clothing of prisoner uniforms, Nazi uniforms, armbands, wooden stars, old shoes, and glasses. Things from the camps like barbed wire, chains, and keys. Books, diaries, pages, drawing by children and newspaper. I see this work as highly emotive, almost entrancing. It can be very hypnotic viewing experience that will give visitors a chance to reflect and contemplate this solemn historic moment, a moment that we are actually still going through and need to accept as part of our life. In a way, the Holocaust continues till today, which is why the objects never hit the ground. They remain in constant free fall. In the filtered light and shadows of the trees above, just beyond the film, inscribed on a highly reflective, polished granite surface, the visitor will see the words of Sarah Grossman, a survivor of the Auschwitz, Unterlass, and Bergen-Belsen. When you see the pictures of the dead bodies, you see just pictures. You don't see the eyes that talk to you and beg you for water. You don't see the mouths quietly trying to say something and not being able to utter a word. These are not the words of a poet, an author, or a philosopher. Rather, they are the recorded words of a survivor. And yet they remind visitors with complete clarity that no matter how powerful an experience we provide, 
nothing can make us fully comprehend the horror of the Holocaust. At this point in the walkthrough, the visitor will begin to hear the sound created by Susan Phillips. Phillips has adapted her landmark study for strings, derived from a 1943 orchestral work by Pavel Haas, the incarcerated Jewish composer that was performed by fellow musician inmates at the Theresienstadt transit camp. In this new work, the violin parts have been singled out and will play over eight speakers as visitors move towards the exit into more openness, with the Peace Tower and Canada's Parliament buildings coming into view. The work will act as a poetic allegory to survival and as a poignant ode to loss. Singling out one sound from the entire orchestra will speak directly to the singling out of a people. The very foundational act that enabled this massive genocide to occur. And the reverberation of the sound and moments of silence in the monument will further highlight its emptiness, a direct reference to the void left by the Holocaust that continues to be felt. As the visitor leaves the core of the monument, they finally get a glimpse of Parliament Hill in the distance. This is a deliberate act on our part and is symbolic of the journey of the lucky few who survived the Holocaust and made it to the safety of Canada, where three generations later they have prospered and contributed greatly to the peace and prosperity of Canada and the world. Visible as you exit the core of the monument is the complimentary exhibit space, a weatherproof glass vitrine with an integrated LCD touchscreen panel. It will be built directly into the berm wall and will be an important component part of the monument experience. To the left, the visitor will see a basin for ceremonial hand washing, placed here at a location that is both an entrance and egress. This overall space is suitable for small gatherings, such as school groups, and may be viewed as an interpretive zone. On the roughened granite wall on the Parliament Hill opening to the monument, visitors will find the words of the Lithuanian doctor Victor Kurtorj, an eyewitness in Vilnius, who wrote in his diary, The soul is torn in two at the sight of the pathetic state that men, women, and children are in. Death is reflected in the eyes of their mothers. Help them. Tell everyone the real truth. Let the whole world know about it. These words are also from an ordinary man and will remind the contemporary visitor why this monument has been built, to let Canadians know and to tell them of the shameful role played by Canada when our country closed its eyes and its doors to the real truth faced by the Jews of Europe. Take a moment to listen to the tonal and atonal sounds and the silence produced by Susan Phillips. Time is the enemy of memory. As the events of the Holocaust fade into history and the last of the survivors are lost to us, the challenge of how to bridge the gap between first-hand experience, abstract understanding, and lack of awareness grows dramatically. The Canadian National Holocaust Monument must build bridges across that gap. As you have seen, our design bridges the gap between those who know and those who may not, between knowledge of history and the unknowable experience of the Holocaust, between visual images and the unimaginable, and between the awareness of evil and the need to act against it. Our multisensory experience creates a connection for all visitors, 
we use the sculpted forms as metaphors for the landscapes of Europe and Canada. But we also use them to celebrate the indomitable spirit of the victims and the survivors. We both mourn and celebrate, and offer the visitor an opportunity to learn and to empathize, so as not to forget, so as not to repeat. This Canadian National Holocaust Monument will forever stand as a unique urban space in our nation's capital, which conveys powerful messages about the Holocaust, the consequences of indifference, and the enduring strength of mankind. Thank you. Merci.